standard perfection description for uh, sable point. They'll just be darker. And they may have more smut on their body. They may have they actually have smut over their back. That's one way when people are trying to tell the difference in the nest box, other than letting them grow some fur, which I'm a great advocate of. <laughs> yeah. um, some colors you want to see them when they're four to six days old and know what color they are, but then let them grow some fur. You'll be able to tell more. Um, a sable point. So I said, I, sure, I want English angoras. What could go wrong? <laughs> and, um, so that pair of English angoras, because I'd uh, been raised registered cattle, had registered horses and colored horses, paint horses, Appaloosas, I was really fascinated by these rabbits because, of course, I had just seen little meat buns. And I um, asked Barry, I said, Barry, where do these rabbits come from? I'd like to know a little more. He goes, oh, let me introduce you to the breeder. She's a wonderful lady. She shows here in Utah, which is where I lived at the time. And she'll get you all fixed up. And that was the start of something wonderful or maybe horrible. Um, I ended up raising and showing English Angoras and very quickly went into French Angoras when I decided furnishings were not for me. Um, and there was a booklet at that time by a reader named Candy Hensel. And Candy Hensel um, was one of the first breeders pioneering blue eyed whites with English Angoras for wool production when he didn't want ruby eyed whites. So she wrote a genetics pamphlet, and all the Angora breeders, this was new, she just wrote it like in 89, so it was fresh off the press when I started getting going in that. And I looked at it, and it was, the main page is similar to what I handed out here for you. I looked at it, and I'm like, this looks like somebody dumped a bunch of alph alphabet soup on the paper here. And it took me a while for it to click. And this was before the internet. The way it clicked was seeing the rabbits. And of course, with English Angoras, and lesser extent French, you better see them before they're two to four weeks old or you don't even know what color they are because once the little girl's in, they look like little pastel puff balls and you, you can't tell unless you know what their parents were. Um, then I merged into mini lots and then holland lots, which is what I have now. And my favorite with holland lots, I work with pointy white, which is Hemi's. And you don't see too many of them, but that's probably why I like them. I finally got chocolates the last few years. I had blacks and blues for a long time. Now I have chocolates. I'll have lilacs this summer. Anyway. That's a little bit about me. I've been a color genetics nerd for, is that 30 years? That's a long time, a long time. And I learned the hard way. We have a lot of good resources now. Um, I don't know if any of you know Jean Marie Cook. She comes up from South Bend, Indiana. She has a wonderful website. It's designed for Holland, but it has pictures of every color she's been able to ga uh, gather. It's Green Barn Farms is the name of her farm. And if you search Green Barn Farms color matrix, you will find her website with colors on it. And she has been a great friend and genetic helper. And we throw things at each other all the time to see if we can figure out if one of us doesn't know. So let me get started by asking a few questions. How many of you have a scale of 1 to 10? You figure about a 5 with color genetics. How many of you feel like you have about a 0? How many of you are between 1 and 4? How about between 6 and 10? Okay, so we have a wide variety. I'm going to start with, just real quick, um, color genetics is, it follows the rules of all genetics. So, um, does anybody know what a Punnett square is? Yep. All right, we're going to start with the Punnett square. So, when mommy rabbit loves daddy rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, we're all over 18. Yeah. All the creatures at every location we have a lot of genes. At every location we have a variety. If our genes have not mutated into the original wild type, we call it the original wild type, original type genes, they're going to be homozygous for a dominant gene, most likely. So let's say this is a mutated gene. It's a rabbit, so I'm going to call it A. So Daddy Rabbit has one of those original wild type A's, and he also inherited a mutated gene which is the recessive A. Mommy rabbit has two recessive A's. So this is the Punnett square. You can do that with, with any set of genes. Because what happens is when <coughs> the DNA goes into the sperm or into the egg, it splits in half. So each sperm only has half a dad's genetics. Each egg only has half a mom's genetics. And it's pretty much a random assortment. There are exceptions. We won't go into that. But it's pretty much random which half you get. So we don't know if sperm got big A or little A. We don't know if egg got little a or little a, but since they're the same, it doesn't matter. So here's how it works out with offspring. 
you know that every offspring has a chance of inheriting A, 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 when those sperm and egg go together and combine their DNA, or ligaments. <coughs> so it's 50-50 in this situation. Mom and dad can produce offspring just like dad or just like mom. And you don't know what you're going to get. So when you say 50-50, people think, well, I got a litter of five. I got a litter of six. I can divide that. I'm going to get three of one and three of the other. It doesn't work that way. Everybody's flipped a coin ten times in a row and maybe got seven heads. Everybody's had a litter of all bucks, right? No. When you want to know. <laughs> or had a litter of all does or such. So the odds don't play out until you have a great quantity. So if mommy and daddy here had 100 babies, then you'd be pretty close to your 50-50. But if you just have a litter, every time a baby is born, it goes back to that 50-50. So just so you got four of them that were recessive A, doesn't mean that the next one's going to inherit that big A. You still have a 50-50 chance on each baby. So that's why it can be confusing and a little bit difficult to predict things, because it takes time, it takes test readings, it takes litters. So let's get started with the genes of rabbits. So rabbits have five green color genes. And that is there on your paper. They have an A. They have a B. They have a C. They have a D. And they have an E. And when we write this out, if we're writing it for people or on the internet, because there's a lot of good resources on the internet, groups you can join. If you don't know what the second one is, you use an underscore. And in some cases, like with some of these dominant genes, it doesn't even matter if it's carried because they're fully dominant. So um, what I'm going to cover briefly first is if you have a rabbit that is dominant, A, B, C, D, E, that's wild type color. That's like, well, it looks like a cottontail, but our rabbits aren't related to cottontails. They're uh, descended from domestic or from wild European rabbits. All the domestic rabbits in the entire world came from the Iberian Peninsula over in Spain, Portugal, what is Spain and Portugal now? And they're all descended from those European wild rabbits. They got sent here, sent there. Over there where they're wild, they still look wild colored. That very typical kind of browny blacky with the white tummies, the white jaw lining, the white inside the ears, and the white under the tail, right? So that would be chestnut agouti, castor, copper, gray if you have Dutch, sandy if you have Flemish. Those are all of this genotype right here, all the same. Modifiers, which are more complex, which we don't know much about, can affect how each of those varieties look depending on the breed or even depending on your herd or your individual. But they're all the same uh, genetics. A wild rabbit would be homozygous, which means two of the same in a pair. It'd be two big A's, two big B's, two big C's, two big B's, two big E's. That's what the wild rabbit started out at. Over time, genes mutated off of those to form the varieties that we have today. So. I'm going to start with the easiest ones first. So, so B. B is for black. Okay? If you have, I have terrible handwriting, I'm really sorry. If you have a dominant B, oh, to back up for a second, what this is controlling is the two pigments in all mammals, really, that make up all the colors we see. There's black and there's yellow. The fancy names are eumelanin and phaeomelanin. We won't call them that. Black is actually super, super dark brown. It's so concentrated it looks black. And yellow ranges anywhere from a pale cream on up to a bright red. So you have black pigment and yellow pigment. Those are the two pigments when changed by these genes and mutations that make all the rabbits we have. In the wild type like this, the black and yellow is pretty obvious. The rabbit has uh, black ticking. It has a bright yellow midband, and then the pattern gene called the booty patterns that black and yellow all over the rabbit like that and gives it a white belly and gives it um, the eye circles, the nostril markings, the jaw lining, the white under the So back to black. Black, all rabbits have black and yellow, but the black covers the yellow unless something genetic causes it to show. Like here, the booty gene causes the pattern. To, to separate into black and yellow arranged on the rabbit. So a black rabbit, the black shows, it still has yellow pigment behind it, right? Um, if you have dominant black, it's black. If it carries a recessive black, guess what? It's still black because this is completely dominant over this. So the recessive black is brown. 
otherwise known as chocolate. So in order to get a chocolate, you have to breed a rabbit that is chocolate or a rabbit that carries chocolate because to express, those two little bees need to be next to each other. It needs to inherit a little bee from each parent. So you can want chocolates forever. You're never going to get one unless you have one. Or you have a surprise, which happened to me a couple of years ago. It was a good surprise. But I had a doe that I had no idea carried chocolate. I brought her back to her son, and holy smokes, I had chocolate variety in that litter. And I had no idea. It wasn't anywhere under pedigree. Recessives are forever. That is something that can be good or bad. Um, so black, these all fell out on the floor when I was walking up here. But I also am an artist, and I painted a lot of varieties here for us. Here's our black one, and I have a chocolate one here somewhere too. It's a chocolate one. I'm a very visual learner. I like to touch things and I like to look at things, and that helps me. And I need to find my chocolate rabbit. Let me put my black one up first. The chocolate one will come back to me here. It's here somewhere. Well, we're just going to put black up, and when I find chocolate, we'll put them up. Because we're going to move down to D. There's black. D is for density. So if you have a dominant D, it's full density. What do you think happens if the density is recessive? The recessive D stands for dilute. Now, black and chocolate. Chocolate is not the dilute of black. Chocolate is the browning of black. It's two different things. Your chocolate rabbits still have brown eyes. Your chocolate varieties still have brown eyes. They're not a dilute variety. Um, quick note on that. Eye color is typically linked to coat color, <coughs> but not always. It's a separate gene. It's really closely linked. You usually get dilute eyes with dilute colors, and you usually get non-dilute eyes with non-dilute colors. But every once in a while, things get mixed up, and you might get a brown eye blue, and you might get a blue eye or a gray eye black. It can happen for other reasons besides it being mixed up. It does occasionally happen. So dilute works the same way as brown or chocolate. Um, if you have a black rabbit, the dilute of it is blue. What happens if you have a chocolate rabbit? Does anyone know the dilute of chocolate? Lila. Lila. Yeah. So that gives you your four main varieties. Every single color we have in rabbits, domestic rabbits, has one of those four bases. It's chocolate, black, blue, or, or black, chocolate, blue, or lilac base. And oh, there they are, my little babies. Um, <laughs> so there's a chocolate. In a blue, and he's kind of by himself till I find Mr. Lila. I I am going to tell you because of the painting that I did here, my lilacs are really well colored, dense lilacs, and my blues are really dark blues. I'm not saying that in all breeds you're going to get quite this quality of color. <laughs> you should be able to tell the difference in those four, but. Many breeds have a lighter blue and a lighter lilac than that, and maybe a little brighter chocolate. But for our purposes, it to work. That's the color foam Amazon head, and I put a coat over it to make it work, and this is what we got. So here's our four base colors. So now back to Agouti. Since we know Agouti, the wild rabbit, is black based in its original form. We know we have four possibilities off of that then. Or three possibilities, four total, right? I'm sorry that I'm turning my back to you so much here. Had they not fallen out on the floor? Here is our original uh, agouti. If you look really closely, you guys, I blew into his fur. There's a little ring definition there. So, <laughs> a little circle. I have all my goodies have a little ring definition happening. Um, and then our dilute, or I mean our brown, oh, fair spot. And then our opal. 
Does our oh, laurel fall under that too? Not yet. Okay. okay. We're almost there. All right. But they will. They okay. will. That happens on C. We haven't gotten to C yet. All right. Sorry. Yeah, no, you're good. You're, you're ahead. You're thinking. So if you look with your original black blue chocolate and lilac, these should actually be above these because these are original. These are, mu these are mutated. The cell A, which I didn't write down in there, is for cell. So here are where things get interesting. Black, uh, the black, brown, the dilute, dense, only have two choices per gene. So you get one or the other. All of the other um, locations have more. And so you may not even have some of those genes in your population, depending on your breed or what you're working on. So with the agouti location, it's called agouti. The first, so the first one is called agouti after it's placeholder. What do you think is recessive to agouti? We already said cell. What's the third one? Yeah, I heard it. Tan. Tan. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times we will call it otter. The name of the gene is tan pattern, probably because it was named, you're going to find some of these names don't jive right to these. These names were over 100 years ago, researchers, Castle, and a couple other uh, really forward-thinking guys who decided to use some rabbits to figure out population genetics of color, named these genes, and most of these genes they use commercial herds for, so um, most of them are based on agouti, and tan probably fell back onto the same description for mice, because mouse genetics came first. So, Tan pattern, bless this little heart, you start out with a tan. Now, what makes a tan different than an otter? Oh, no, that's a blue one. He's just a great dude. So, tan and otter are genetically the same, if you look, except for a couple of important things. Roof is modifiers. Roof is just means red. And we don't know exactly how rufous modifiers work, except we know they're additive. So we know that you have to have a lot of them. And when you start splitting them up, your color isn't as good. So when you take a Trianta and you breed it to another breed, you're going to get some good reds for a while. But if you keep breeding out, you're going to, I don't want to say dilute because that's the same gene, but that's what happens. You lose the modifiers. Let's say to get a great red, you need one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And let's say you only get one, two, three, four. <coughs> However, those pairs break up. It's very challenging to get them all back together if you're not breeding back to a well-colored red, dark red. Um, so rufus, and then there's another gene that I'm not going to go into in depth, but it applies to tans. Um, it's called the wide band gene, and it's a recessive gene that serves many two purposes. The one thing it does is when you have two copies of it, it's recessive. It has to have two copies to show up is, um, and it's written, I'm going to put it down here by these guys, it's two little W's, white band. Um, it allows the color that the rabbit has, the rufus, to extend all the way to the skin. So it takes out the gray undercolor on the belly, and it widens the midband of the fur if it's an agouti rabbit, or widens the fur toward the skin on a tan pair. And so to get tan, you've got to have both those things, rufus and white band. So another, another reason why it's challenging, introducing new varieties, because you've got to have multiple things. So then we have our otter, which is just like our chestnut agouti or our caster, except it has AT, that's our nomenclature for tan, instead of large A, and then your small A itself. So those, those are the three possibilities. And you see me putting up those Martins, so you know we're going to get to the Martins here in a minute. You got a bunny on the floor, too. Do you want a little oh, casualty, man? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Didn't well, that's, that's he's important. He goes right here. <clears throat> and if you, see, if you see the tan in the inside the ears, that's just my attempt at making it look like this skin inside or out of ears. Mm -hmm. Same thing with the little line around their eyes where you see their skin. So don't mistake that for anything to do with color. Okay, so <coughs> here we have our row. Any questions about how any of these work inheritance-wise so far? 
Yes. <clears throat> I might be jumping ahead here a little bit, but I think one of the recent uh, magazines of the Hollander, uh -huh. <clears throat> they brought up the fact that <coughs> reading uh, Himalayans into your stock to enhance the color. So uh, my specialty with Holland Lops is pointed white. I've been raising them for 20 years. One thing it can help a lot with is your shaded colors, your sable gene colors. Ruby eyed white also is helpful, but there's some argument for, from our Netherlands friend, that Kimmy is better, pointed white is better. Um, as far as enhancing your other colors, it wouldn't do anything with the A gene, the B gene, the D gene at all, because those are totally dominant over what they do. Nothing's changing what they do. And on E, it's questionable. But um, how it influences your C colors might be a good exercise. I have found, I, I have sables and snow pearls, and I use pointy whites with them almost exclusively. In fact, I think I only have one red white, white carrier in my herd anymore. And he's a self chin. We'll come back to that in a minute. Um, we, we do both. I just wonder if it's. Oh, you mean the Himalayan, breed, the Himalayan breed? Yeah. Oh, I would never do that. <laughs> I don't know why you would do that. Uh, it was in the magazine, so. I think, I wonder if they're talking about the Himalayan color. Okay, but to bring out the jowl color in the Hollander? I'm going to have to look, is, was it in the Hollander? Yeah. I'm going to have to look in the Hollander because I didn't see it phrased like that, but maybe I missed something. But yeah, I don't think you'd ever make it back to type if you brought a Holland lot to a Hemi breed. I mean, you're talking totally two different things. You're talking a Pringles oh, yeah. can oh, versus yeah. a little tiny French bulldoggy little droppy rabbit. Yeah. I think you would have a big mess. I'm going to also say all of these color genetics exercises, um, people get really excited and say, okay, I have this and this, I can make this. Sometimes when you have a, a knowledge of the ABCDEs, you can make things, but that doesn't mean you can make good things. Because depending on what's been, Flemish Giant is, oh, did you have questions? I just, I just as a quadrant square, uh -huh. the upper right. It should be too little. Like, yeah, I just, this should be the yeah. It's right here and right here. Only, only because they were yeah. It's my ADD. But I'm filming so it, so I yeah. wanted you to correct it that. so that yeah, you wouldn't get off into the. There it is. There uh, it is. Woo! We're same happy. results, different squares. Yeah, Sorry, I appreciate you. that. So, Flemish giants. Be anyone here does Flemish? Yeah. So you know, in your breed, if you wanted to, you could make opens. You can make tort, and you can make all manner of sins by proceeding correctly, right? <laughs> who knows, besides our Flemish people, who knows when the last new variety was introduced to the Flemish Giants? Anybody? It was 1932. Oh, wow. Okay? So, for 90 years, people have crossed a certain way within this breed. I think there's a seven or there eight? Seven. Seven. Seven varieties, that's it. Flemish giants come in sandy, which is our chestnut booty. They come in a light gray, which is chinchilla. They come in a dark gray, which is black silver tipped steel, which have white bellies, by the way, most of the time, which is a modifier that I think only Flemish has. They come in blue, they come in black, they come in fawn, which is not a dilute fawn, <coughs> it's a full color fawn with brown eyes, full, full density. And they have white. So that's eight? Yeah, I think that's eight. So you don't cross some of those things. If you have all the genes within the Flemish breed to make black tort, blue tort, um, to make uh, lots of things. You can make <laughs> squirrel, blue chinchilla. But you know what happens when you do that? They have crossed for 90 years a certain way, and those modifiers that we talked about that we don't have a map for. We have a map for this, just this really basic stuff. We don't have a map for modifiers. It might happen the same way if you have really nice torts in your Holland Lops. What happens if you get a tort from somebody else's herd? You breed them together, do you all of a sudden get really pitiful marking color? Maybe they're mealy and they're washed out, or maybe they're just way too dark Madagascar looking torts and you didn't want those. Whenever you cross into something that you have not been funneling yourself or other breeders have been funneling for you, you run the risk of screwing up your good colors while you're trying to make something else. So just to keep in mind, this is a tool. Doesn't mean you should do everything with it unless you have a lot of freezer space or a really good pet outlet or another purpose besides trying to put them back into your show herd. Um, so now we're going to talk about chin. I don't even know if I'm running out of time. Oh yeah, I am getting so close to the end here. Um, C is the next one. So C has all the things. 
C stands for full color. Okay? It has recessives on it, which would be, you see them superscripted. CCHD is chinchilla dark. That is your traditional black chinchilla. I'm sorry, they don't translate it to being painted as well as some of the other colors, but this is my attempt at a black chinchilla. I'm going to put them in their own world right here. And you're just going to have to ignore that there's chocolate in there. So that's a black chinchilla. And then if you have a dilute chinchilla, some breeds call it squirrel, some breeds call it blue chinchilla. You also then can have chocolate chin and lilac chin. What the chin dark gene does is take out, it's, color, it's the color location, chin dark takes out all, no, not, not all, almost all yellow and a little tiny bit of black. So there's not enough yellow there for you to see it. So any place on that wild rabbit that was yellow, that banding, that ticking, now turns white. In some reason it's called curl, but it's white. And it works, again, these guys all have green color. You see, I blew into their fur too. Um, <laughs> The, the chinchilla gene, if it doesn't have a big agouti gene, if it doesn't have that dominant agouti gene, it doesn't have that tan pattern gene. That's where you get your martins. Martins are an otter that have a chin gene dominant instead of a full color gene dominant. You only have a couple other otters here somewhere. Also, I forgot with our, with our tan pattern. Yeah, that's our little fox. Okay, so a fox is when you get tan pattern gene on what would otherwise be a tortoise. And I didn't have time to paint every single one of everything. I could have painted 140 different things and I just ran out of time and told me, oh, patience. But um, uh, being developed in Netherlands North right now, past the showing, can be shown. Um, for that's exhibit. without the wide band gene. Without the wide band gene, what happens to them with the wide band gene? I have not bred fox before. What what does it do to it? If it has the wide band gene, it takes it color out like a red. Because it takes the it takes the blue undercolor. No, there's no blue undercolor on the tort. It just extends yeah, your color in your you points. Have a white belly, you can yeah. Look like a red. So instead of that, it's going to look like that. Yep. Yep. And. Interesting fact, we think of reds as an agouti color. I used some Trianta for some crossing ones. Some of your Trianta are tan pattern reds. Uh -huh. yeah. mm -hmm. They're not all agouti reds. So um, you just don't cross them that often, so you don't know that. But they also were developed from the breed tans over in Europe. So the white energy makes sense. OK, so coming along with that chin gene, the next one below it is going to be C C H L. That stands for chinchilla light. And the reason it was called chinchilla light is back in Castle's day, they were studying rabbits that had a dominant booty. And so they were looking like a chin, but they were faded. What they actually were stable chins. So they got stable chins, they called them chin light. We don't do a lot with stable chins in most breeds. Mini lops, English lops, and uh, French lops recognize stable chin and smoke pro chin. And they are shigooty, the dreaded shigooty. Never cross shaded in a booty. Except if you have mini laps, you can cross pretty much anything you want. <laughs> and, um, so what we do in most breeds is we use that sable gene, chin light is called the sable gene, to make, guess what, sable. So I'm going to put them over here since I'm running out of room on my big board. So a black sable is your typical American sable, right? And then your blue sable is your smoke pearl. It is also possible to make chocolate sables and lilac sables. What happens though with chocolate sables and lilac sables um, is you have less contrast. These are really optimistically painted. In, <laughs> in most chocolate and lilac sables, it's very subtle. The point color and the saddle difference is super subtle. You might not catch it, but what you will catch is eye color. And why do you think you would catch eye color in a chocolate or lilac sable. 
So chocolates and lilacs, as a variety, tend to have a ruby glow to the pupil. Sable tends to have a ruby glow to the pupil. You put those two things together and you can get some wild eyes on these little guys. The iris lightens up and the ruby glow can be very, very accentuated. So they can look almost like a Latino, and I'm talking about those, or a ruby eyed white situation. So next down from, so there's our table. I, I did not have a chance to paint Shigui's, um, but I did paint my little Henry's. Black, blue, chocolate, and lilac. And I am going to just put them. They've got to be in here somewhere. Right here. Don't let them breathe. Well, you know, it's a crop, <laughs> color crop. So they come in all four point colors. Um, so going back to what that does, I think I told you Chin Jean takes out just a little slice of the black and almost all the yellow. Sable Jean takes out even more black and all the yellow. The reason why you see what might be yellow in your sables is just faded brown that gets yellow with age. It's not because they have fail melanin, they don't have any fail melanin, but it can yellow because black turned to brown getting old and diluted by other things can look yellowish. So there's our hemi gene, or it's C8 on your sheet. CH stands for hemi, Himalayan, because Himalayan was actually already a breed back in 1913 when Castle et al. were studying genetics. And then, of course, our most recessive on the C series is our ruby eyed white. And that is just a little C. And the little C takes out all the color. You have red eyes because it's blood vessels and structures reflecting off each other, and but there's not a drop of color in those guys. Totally recessive, but if you get two copies, one from each parent, it masks everything else you have. So your ruby eyed white rabbits actually have the genes to be something besides a full color gene or a chin gene. They cannot carry, that's the other thing, a dominant gene can carry anything beneath it in the ladder, but a recessive gene cannot carry anything above it in the ladder. So if you have a ruby eyed white, it can't carry sable, it can't carry chin, it can't carry full color, but it can create all of those if you breed it to the right mate because it's recessive to all of those. So it'll pull Ruby eyed white is a great equalizer to help pull things out of birds that you're trying to find. If you're trying to find some of these other recessive color genes, ruby eyed white or hemi sometimes is the way to go to find it. Last on the list is our extension gene. So extension means that that black and yellow I was talking about is either extended over the whole hair shaft or not extended over the whole hair shaft. So if it's extended over the whole hair shaft, a black rabbit is black. If it's not extended over the hair, whole hair shaft, a black rabbit is black tort. So black and torts are genetically the same, except for that extension and non-extension gene. And of course, we have chocolate torts. Again, this is a very optimistic chocolate tort. Most of your chocolate torts don't have that much contrast. One thing to remember, if you're trying to, it happens a lot with torts. I see people see a very browny tort. And they say, oh, it must be chocolate torts. If your rabbit has any black or gray, it is not chocolate. Chocolate cannot produce black or gray pigment. So it might be a very brownie tort, but to be a chocolate tort, all of the point color, there's not black hair on that rabbit, all the point color shading is chocolate. It usually has less um, contrast than that. And then here is our blue tort and, whoops, blue tort and lilac tort. And our lilac torts and blue torts have a little bit of what we call phenotypic overlap, which means they can look really much the same. I had blue torts that were so pale that I was pretty sure they were lilac torts. It was genetically possible. But then when I bred them to something, they produced black, so I knew that they couldn't be. And so what I happened? I you, Laura, but are you running out of time, girl? I think I'm running out of time. Are we ready to stop? Or? Yeah. Okay, well, I think it's like nine minutes. Okay. I have nine minutes? Okay. Oh, <laughs> now you did it. So, <laughs> If we add the agouti gene back to these guys, is when we get our oranges or red. I have the red over there. Red is either going to be black or chocolate based. The best, the best ones are going to be our black based. I don't know of a breed that has true nice bright reds that are kind of doing chocolate based. It's probably possible. So, you have? So here's our oranges. Oranges, I made my oranges a little bit smutty because. I wanted to show what color smut they had. 
if they're a black squirt or if they're black with the black base orange, any of those little hairs on them maybe are going to look slate gray or black. If you have a chocolate orange, you're not going to get nearly as much contrast because it's going to be a brown color. And then your creams, or in some breeds called fawns, are dilute because our dilute gene, guess what? Black and chocolate don't work on yellow, but extension does with the density gene. So if you have a dilute color, it dilutes your yellow as well as your black. So these guys, you can see, are lighter shade. So that's with the Agouti gene. Now if we add a tan pattern gene, this guy goes here. And then I didn't do the rest of those. But you can see it looks like Torx is because that intermediate gene, that tan pattern gene, has the same markings as an Agouti as far as the white belly, the white jowls, the white inside the ears, the white under tail, but it has a, a self-colored body. Does not have. If you blow into his fur, it looks the same as if you blew into his fur on the back. If you blow into his fur, it'll look a little different. But because we don't have, we have the extension taking out the black or brown, you're not going to see much for ring. Like I didn't put ring on them because it would just look orange all the way down to the white skin. So these guys have that blue, slate blue or dove gray undercolor. Your good, uh, unless they're super smutty. Your good oranges aren't going to have an undercolor. They're going to be orange to the skin with maybe some black tipping on them. And so the one thing I did not color is what stable we have over here does with non-extension. What stable does with non-extension is make stable points. Or blue points, or chocolate points, or lilac points. <laughs> yay! All of them! Yay! Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can show all those now. So, here is the sable gene with non-extension. So what non-extension does, it does the same thing it does on the tort. It keeps the dark color extending on the body, but because we also have the sable gene, it took all the yellow out. So now their body is creamy to white in the best examples. Sometimes you have really smutty ones. Also, this gene, stable, is not completely dominant. It's one of those ones that plays with others. If you have two stable genes, do you have a stable? What do you get if you have two stable genes? You have a seal. So you can have a black seal, which a lot of times will look like a black, or it can look kind of chocolatey, like dark brown bird chocolate. Usually you can see darker points. You can also have a dilute seal, which is blue-ish. You can also have a grinding. <laughs> You can also have, sorry, it's, it's, I got a dome from the sibling named Rhino from the blue seal. Um, <laughs> and you can have a lilac seal, and you can have a chocolate seal. They just look like a bad version of their self, of their self full color. So a chocolate seal looks like a bad chocolate. It may have wonky eye color though. With the sable points, they still meet, in most breeds, they're going to meet the standard perfection description for sable point. They'll just be darker. And they may have more smut on their body. They may have they actually have smut over their back. That's one way when people are trying to tell the difference in the nest box, other than letting them grow some fur, which I'm a great advocate of. <laughs> yeah. Um, some colors you want to see them when they're four to six days old and know what color they are, but then let them grow some fur. You'll be able to tell more. Um, a sable point in the nest box versus a sable in the nest box. Um, is you're going to have color on the flanks on your non-extension color. See torts, that tort swoop, I call it the Nike swoop, goes up their sides. Your, your torts and your sable points tend to have shading on their sides. Your Siamese sables tend to have a darker saddle over the back and be lighter on their sides and lighter on their chest as well. So lighter chest, lighter flank, darker back versus lighter back, darker flank. See how it's opposite there? So that's one way to start telling on your babies, because you can have some fallacious dark sable points, especially when it's cold out. So I'm probably really super out of time now. Anybody have questions? I know I went over things super fast. I did leave a sign-up sheet up here if you want. I'm going to put some of this stuff on my website. Some of it's already there. And I'll send you a link if you want to write down either your email address or your phone number. Anybody have any questions? And I can tell you, Laura is probably more than happy to answer color questions. I love Laura. <laughs> it may take me a little time. Like if you're not, a, I, you're welcome to message me on Facebook. That's kind of how it works the best of times because we can send pictures quickly. 
But if you're not on my friends list, if I don't find you for a week, I'm sorry, sometimes I don't find you for a week. Um, <laughs> Laura? Yes? One quick, um, we talk about having a really nice, clean, stable point. So yes. That, the best, two things you need to do. You need to select from your best ones because you're putting those modifiers, just like our Flemish people are putting in modifiers for good belly, for a good ring color, keeping the muddiness out, keeping things good. So select the white ones. And then also, if you can incorporate ruby eyed white or pointed white in there, your sable points that carry ruby eyed white or pointed white are going to be whiter in the body because that sable gene is only semi dominant over yeah. ruby eyed white and white. So just like a sable without ruby eyed white or pointed white turns into a seal, a sable point turns into technically a seal point. But again, they're not so dark that they're disqualified. Also, if you have a super clean one and you also show the broken dried in your breed, Sometimes your super clean ones are cute because you can't discern broken cat on them. So that's something to remember. If you're breeding a breed that has broken and solid sable point, um, a little darker looks bad on the solids, but it looks great on the broken. Because otherwise, you might not by the time they're adults. If they're this white, by the time you get broken on there, you're never going to see it. So that's something to think about. They're also slightly temperature sensitive, like the hemis are. So in cold weather, if you're growing them fur, they're going to tend to be a little smuttier than if they're growing them fur in one pot. What is temperature? Is that, is that how <laughs> <laughs> um, You can Google uh, temperature studies on rabbit coat color, and there's some really interesting studies with hemi colored rabbits where they shave them down and put ice on them for a period of time, and when they grow their fur back, it grows back almost black in that area. If any of you have had hemis or pointed whites that get chilled in the nest box, and by chilled I mean at the top of the pile is all it takes. They don't have to be like out of the box, but just the top of the pile where the fur's been off for a few minutes. You might not even know what color you have in there. You look at that and go, what is that little gray thing out of my two hemi parents? Did like somebody hop in that didn't belong here? Who's the daddy? But that chilling causes the baby coat to come in with dark coloring for a temporary amount of time. And it'll shed out from the adult coat. And a lot of times those are your really good colored hemis. Um, if they tend to chill, a lot of times they tend to also have dark color. Does that also matter on other colors or the white The C series colors, anything? Recessive to the full color C, in my opinion, tend to be slightly temperature sensitive. Not the pins as much, but definitely sable can be. I also feel like torts are slightly temperature sensitive. I feel like my torts are, and my oranges tend to be more smutty when it's cold. But that could be my herd. They all carry hemi, so you know. I don't think that plays like that, but I'm not. I'm not. I have no way to prove it. Does that last forever, then, Laura, or no. does it molt out? No, anything temperature sensitive changes. Like if you, um, if you raise Californians or Hemis and want really beautiful point color for nationals, you usually keep them in uh, an air conditioned place. You don't let them be out under the tree when it's 90 because they're going to grow in real patchy like point color. So um, on the next coat change, though, if you correct the temperature to where you want it, you'll get better color. And if you want less smut or less color, same thing, keep them in a warmer place. That would be for Hemis, sable points, Possibly towards very minor. Towards, yeah, cows for sure. Yeah, that's the other thing that happens. We didn't talk about what happens with hemis, cow, pointed whites, all the same thing by different names. If you have tan pattern or a booty with them, it in our standard perfection it calls it martinized, which describes it phenotypically, but it can also be from the booty versus the tan pattern gene. It's going to DQ your point color. It's going to give them white ear edging, and it's going to give them. Uh, white nostril markings and white down the lip because the tan pattern and the booty pattern puts that pattern on just their points. Um, one thing I didn't color, cover on the E series because it's not a recognized color in many breeds. The recessive little E is here, but in between these two is EJ. <laughs> That's a whole nother 10 minutes. <laughs> EJ is your, your Harlequin G. J stands for Japanese, which is what the original name for the black orange harlequin was called a Japanese harlequin. <clears throat> and what that means is instead of full extension, like the capital E that keeps your black pigment covering, or non-extension, which pulls your black pigment back, EJ is interrupted pigment. So you get black orange, black orange, black orange. Or brindle, black orange. For those of you working with mini lops, that's a thing. They're working on a COD for an actual brindle. Mini Rex has a mini Rex. Oh, Mini Rex, I lied. It's Mini Rex, except Rex. <laughs> yeah, same thing like with that. 
<laughs> mini rack, sorry. Yes, the brindle means that your black orange is interrupted in a very small pattern versus your alternating ones. So EJ is a thing in there. I just didn't have time to paint them and talk about them today because you're not going to show them in any green right now besides the actual Harlequin green. And if you're showing the actual Harlequin green, I strongly recommend finding a mentor that knows about them because they're their own thing. They are very specific on their pattern alternations. And uh, it's a game of chance with them too, I hear too. <laughs> it's not all, not all things we know, we're still learning. Anything else? Is my email address. You're welcome to drop me an email. If you need more information from me and want to contact me, I'm happy to give you my Facebook handle. I'd love to talk to you.